If there's one figure in gaming that I always want more of, it's Wario. Whether it's the WarioWare series or the Wario Land series, I'm always interested in what Wario has going on in his own world. Speaking of world, Wario World is a Wario-based game that I feel gets forgotten in the conversation of Nintendo games, and especially Wario games. 20 years ago, Wario World released on the GameCube, and for me, who has always been playing and enjoying the Wario Land games, specifically putting all my time into Wario Land 4 on the Game Boy Advance, it was very exciting to see a full-fledged Wario game of some similar vein on a home console. Now fully in 3D, the game wasn't exactly like the series was. It wanted to be a larger experience, something new for the character and his adventures, which is what Nintendo was all about for their own gaming scene on the GameCube, letting other characters expand into new adventures and not being afraid to try something new or different. I think the Wario games always try to do something fun or unique whenever there is something new from the Mario side character. Last year we looked into Wario Land Shake It, a Wii game that would take the older Wario Wario Land format, re-establish it for a home console release with a gorgeous cartoon art style, as that game remains one of the best Wii games that not enough people played. So today, we are going to look back at Wario World for the GameCube, and see if it is this underappreciated gem of a game that you should go back and play if you are a fan of the Wario games in general. Welcome back to the 25 Days of Fringemas, where there's going to be brand new- Wait, 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 wait. Uh-uh. Ah. Double fringe miss. Aw, you only thought you were gonna get 25 videos this year? Look at you. You look silly. But I'm here to fix that because I'm gonna give you not only 25 videos, but I'm giving you 50 videos. I have two channels. That's two fringe misses. Each day there'll be a brand new video on both channels for 25 days. I haven't slept in months. Enjoy the content. Or don't. We enter in on the game with Wario on top, finally feeling like the worth that he's been seeking constantly. But nothing great lasts forever when one of his treasures turns out to be this evil black jewel and evicts Wario from his own castle. And for all of his treasure, they're scattered around and also turned into various monsters, creatures, and things I can't even describe. The castle itself becomes this split up world to adventure to get back to comfortably sitting on your rightful throne. And these four areas all have a bit of stuff to do. It's not the longest game in the world, but each area you explore will be full of enemies to beat up so you can suck up all the coins they turn back into. It's slightly terrifying, but oddly satisfying, as well as collecting the various treasures in each of the worlds. Early on in the GameCube's life, this game was shown off back during E3 2002, at least alerting gamers that Wario's first standalone 3D adventure is on the way. But it was nothing more than a brief look at the technology and what to expect. With the game not being up to where it needed to be and ready for launch, the November 2002 release date wouldn't be met and following that, the next one wouldn't be hit either. It wouldn't be until E3 2003 that we got to see a more fleshed out version of the game as a push to sell the finished version of it as it would release in late June of 2003. And it really benefited from more time going into the game. It absolutely looks incredible and it's easily up to par with the high quality Nintendo output of offerings. Get ready for some real green. The game was developed by the Studio Treasure, a fitting name for Wario going after his treasure, and a studio mainly known for more anime-based video games, most famously the Sin and Punishment games for Nintendo, and for some reason that McDonald's Treasure Land adventure game on the Sega Genesis. So an odd choice for a Wario game that is a mix of a 3D platformer and brawler, but nevertheless, the extra time spent polishing the game really worked out in their favor, as it not only looks great, it plays great. Even though I see the Sin and Punishment games as severely underrated and unappreciated, it's nice to see that there was a good relationship between the developers and Nintendo to want to work together on something again post the release of the first Sin and Punishment game. The main gameplay here is pretty straightforward. You run around linear and somewhat open areas platforming around to collect your treasure back, defeating enemies for your coins and saving spritelings. The spritelings are the ones that have kept the evil jewel at bay originally, and by rescuing them now is how you're going to start figuring out how to stop what's going on, but really for how the ending turns out. But we'll get to that bit in a bit. Each area or or world you explore has two main parts to it, essentially two levels of a similar thing in an area. First you start out in Excitement Central, a forest area that is filled with lush environments and is an easy enough more tutorial based zone that gets you your bearings quick and gives you a boss fight at the end. This battle toad of a boss named Green Fist is similar to fighting the regular enemies, but once you hit him enough times you take out part of his life points with a more powerful attack before you're granted access to the next area of the world. The second area is based on more ancient ruins along 
along with a fun sandworm boss at the end, but something about this level now opens up how the rest of the levels will go. Having to defeat more powerful enemies at some points in the level that are more akin to mini bosses before you get to the boss at the end, and once you beat both of the levels in this world, also meaning defeating both bosses, you'll get to take on the top boss of the world in general, which here is Dino Mighty, and defeating her will get you a piece of the huge treasure chest key, needing four parts collected to go and unlock the final battle against the evil jewel. So once you get the first part, you're able to enter on into the next world of the game, Spooktastic World, with the first level here being a spooky mansion, and Wario is no stranger to having a few run-ins with the paranormal, but he ain't scared of no ghost, so you truck on through this, do your Wario thing, and defeat Brawl Doll and get access to Spooky Circus. I'm breezing over Brawl Doll because I'm terrified of looking at it. And great, I can only guess that by the end of this really fun level that Spooky Circus is, that I will have to fight some scary clown. Oh, clown around. It's not so scary, a bit creepy, and I wouldn't want to hang out with a guy who steals Where's Waldo's hat, but it could have been much worse. Then you get the next boss battle with Dual Dragon, and look at that, another piece of the key. That's convenient. Now, the next world is called Thrillsville, and what a disappointing turn of events when you find out this isn't a theme park. The first level is a snow and ice filled mountain area, and oh my god, this. This is when you decide to terrify me, not so much in the horror-themed levels of the last world, but with this absolute uncomfortable to look at boss battle, Winter Winster is horrifying and has been in my nightmares ever since I laid eyes on this thing. Well, after conquering my fears head on, the next level is filled with beanstalks to traverse. It looks visually cool, but I am not getting those thrills I was promised with the name of this area. Then you fight a spider named Spider Atticus, and again, both of these boss battles are in Thrillsville and not Spooktastic World. All right then, at least the big boss fight here is this absolute Chad Red Brief J, and that makes me feel a bit better. His briefs are also actually red, so that's on brand for him. And being around the lava to warm up as I'm still a bit cold from the icy mountains is a nice touch. The last world we now visit is Sparkle Land, and the first level here is really cool. It's called Mirror Mansion, which is a giant house of mirrors level. Again, visually really cool and a fun idea for a level in a game like this. Then you fight this weird looking fella named Mean MC. I guess I can't really say much because I'm a weird looking fella myself. Myself, and the final area is filled with sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating and it gets everywhere, or whatever Anakin says in Star Wars. Then you fight this iron head named Iron Cider, unlocking your last boss fight to get the final piece of the key, Captain Skull, because a skeleton pirate was what I was expecting the final boss here to be. But all of the main final bosses of each world have been something that feels kind of random. This Double Fringe Miss is brought to you by Gamer Subs. All right, all right, all right, yeah, you got me. It's time to talk about Gamer Subs a little bit. Look, it's fantastic. I love the brand. There's some really awesome people behind the scenes. They're supporting the heck out of the channel and you're supporting the heck out of them, which in turn supports the heck out of the channel. So thank you. Really. Thank you. It's also less than one calorie per serving and sugar free. And if you go over to GamerSubs, hit that link down below. Guess what? 10% off. Use code fringe. 10% off. I know you don't want to pay that 10%. So don't. Use code FRINGE. But okay, now that you've done all that, you finally can get access to the final fight against Black Jewel, and holy heck, this final fight is intense, visually stunning, and just a blast to play. And by the end, you defeat Black Jewel and get to sit back on your throne as if nothing happened and all is good, depending on what happened along your journey, which I think is a really cool way to make you want to replay the game if you haven't done everything I'll mention in a moment, or just want to experience all the endings. So the Spritelings are the key to your success in the end, depending on how many of them you went out of your way to save throughout the levels will determine what you get in the end. There are six different endings here, and it's broken down to the amount of the Spritelings that you've rescued. So to get the regular ending of the castle being just like it was at the start of the game, you need to rescue between 31 and 39 of them. There are three levels under that that have varying versions of the castle from a wooden design if you only rescued between two and 10 of them, a castle made of basic stone if you rescued 11 to 20 of them, and a silver castle instead of your old gold one if you rescued between 21 and 30 of them. But the two other options are the most entertaining versions. If you ended up rescuing all 40 Spritelings, you'll get the full treasure ending, having a better and more dripped out and luxurious castle than you started out the game with, and Wario gets that reward for leaving no Spriteling behind. It's great to see him get rewarded for all the good that he's done. But on the other hand, if you only ever rescue just one Spriteling throughout your whole playthrough, you get 
nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's just Wario who is set up with a tent and a campfire in the middle of the woods. And I love this. This is so great, honestly. I love little differences in games like this. And it does drive you to go back and play through the game again if you didn't fully complete it. There's other bonuses in the game that I think are really freaking cool too. I'm not just talking about the base collectibles such as sucking in all the coins or getting all the gold statues of yourself or even garlic. But there's technically a bit of another Wario game in here as well. If you collect all the treasure in each level, you'll get a handful of micro games from the recently released WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games for the Game Boy Advance. If you have a Game Boy Advance in general, you can connect it to the GameCube, download the micro games, and enjoy them on the device until you turn it off and download them again. So it serves as a really unique way to get a reward for collecting all the treasure in a level as a demo for another Wario game that had just come out a month before. It's a really cool extra bonus, honestly. Wario World slaps. The game is so much fun, has creative level designs, and looks absolutely gorgeous on the GameCube. It plays really well, it's not a super long game, and it's so satisfying to just beat up and mangle around the enemies as you then proceed to turn Wario's mouth into Luigi's ghost vacuum, but for coins. The game sold pretty decently, reaching player's choice status, and overall the reviews were pretty decent. It just sits on a level all its own because we haven't had a Wario game like it since. It just sits there, stuck on the GameCube with little to no mention of it. I feel it's extremely underrated and deserves your attention to give it a shot. For the Nintendo Switch, at bare minimum, I'd love to see it be on their online services so more can go and check it out. It's great that we still get WarioWare games at a decent rate, but the Wario Land series, and by extension this Wario World game, truly deserve a nice comeback in some sort of way, but you tell me. Would you like a new game like this for Wario or some kind of HD remake of it? Heck, did you ever play this Wario World game? Let me know in the comments below. I've been Jordan Fringe, thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe, later.